We'll start from right where we left off in the last chapter. However, this time, OpenGL will not show RenderWorks camera effects, which is what we're going to be covering in this video. So we'll need these two to be a different rendering mode that includes RenderWorks camera effects. Uh, we'll go in more detail over the RenderWorks modes and RenderWorks styles later. For now, we'll just quickly go in and we'll choose high quality render as a RenderWorks style for both of these. So select both viewports. And then for the RenderWorks style, we'll choose high quality render. Now we'll check and make sure that high quality render has the option for camera effects enabled, and it does. We'll click OK. And if we were to render these right now, they would render in that camera mode. In fact, we'll go ahead and do that now so you can see what it looks like with no camera effects enabled. This particular type of rendering with doing camera effects means that we're generally going to be doing relatively high quality renderings that will take quite a while. So what I'll do is I'll simply skip ahead so you don't have to watch the entire render here. And whenever you see this icon at the bottom center of the screen, that means I've accelerated past a render point. You can simply pause the video, and then once your rendering is finished, you can go ahead and continue. It'll take different amounts of time than mine, uh, based on machine hardware, what CPU you have, things like that. So when this is done, I'll be back. And we're done. That took about four minutes each on this end, I would say, maybe five, so that's not too terribly bad. These rendering modes are, this is not the highest quality you can get. This is just high enough quality that we'll actually see the camera effects we're going to apply. So we'll click on the viewport, right click on it so we can edit the camera. We'll go ahead and say don't show this dialog again because we're going to be doing this a few times and we don't need to see this alert every time. Click OK. Now this will be back in OpenGL since the camera was in OpenGL and the design layer doesn't want to update and do that render right away. And the first thing on this list is depth of field, but we'll do something special for that. Enable exposure by checking this box. And then we'll do two examples. So in the first one, we'll do we'll go for sort of a darker sort of rainy day look. Um, a note about exposure in renderings. ISO film speed and shutter speed are not the same as they are with film cameras or digital cameras. So we can brighten it very easily, but it's very hard to darken a scene. Generally, if you want a scene to appear much darker than it actually was to start with, modify the lighting instead rather than trying to go with exposure. Exposure in RenderWorks is very good at making things much brighter than they actually were to start with. So the two examples we'll do for exposure, we'll start with a sort of rainy day gray sort of look and then a fairly bright daytime look. So for this viewport, we'll set the ISO to 50. And we'll set the shutter speed to 1 1,000th of a second and click return to viewport. Now, we want to do two trials. So what we'll do is we'll zoom out and we'll option click this viewport and duplicate it. If we edit this viewport's camera, this was a duplicate of the one we just changed. So you can see here, its exposure settings are the same. If I change this exposure, We'll make this one the daytime one. So we'll leave this at 50, actually, and we'll change this to 1 to 250. That should be a significantly brighter, since it's a longer shutter speed. Now, if I go back and I edit this previous one that we didn't change, you'll see that it stays at 50 and 1 1,000th 1, of a second. So we can update these both at the same time, and we'll be able to compare the two results. There we go, and as you can see, the top one here, we got sort of a rainy day look. Do you see how the sky got a darker gray? That happened because while the background was a light blue, we turned down the exposure, so it got less of it. So it got that sort of stormy look to it, that sort of deep gray. And the one below here is extremely bright. This is actually a little too bright probably for this background because the sky is never that bright day glow blue, but that shows off the feature. Uh, what we really wanted to see here was just changing the exposure, not actually changing the light at all, and how you can actually modify your renderings. You'll want to play with this a little bit, and you can see how it sort of washes out colors. You can see the door down here is a bright yellow, and it's almost orange up here. Same with the water, and same with the tile here. Next thing to cover is Bloom, which we'll use this interior render for. Again, we'll be duplicating it. But this time, we're really just going to show one explanation of it. Bloom is fairly straightforward. So we have one duplication here. We'll edit the camera. Now this camera we didn't already apply anything to, so when we go down here there should be no camera effects, yeah. And in here we're just going to give it a 25% bloom. Hit return to viewport. And then this is will remain to be our comparison. This is with no camera effects and this will be with bloom at 25%. And hit update. 
Now, quick note about camera effects. On the other two renderings, you could see the darkness and the lightness appear in the exposure example. You could see those while it was happening. With Bloom and I believe Vignette, you won't see that effect until the very end of the render. So as you can see, the render is going on here. It looks almost identical to this one. The Bloom effect will not come in until after this is fully resolved. And there we go. You see, it gives it that sort of dreamy quality to it. 25 is pretty high. Anything 50% or above, you sort of get into the drunken head trauma level of bloom. But yeah, anything between 1 and about 25% will give you a nice little flaring effect. And you can see where the light comes out of the skylight or comes out of windows and splashes across things. It'll give them a nice bright splash of bloom. It'll basically enhance anywhere that light touches will be significantly brighter and sort of glow. Uh, speaking of vignette, as we did a moment ago, we'll go ahead and do that as the reference now. So in here, we'll edit this camera. And we'll scroll down, and this is our bloom example. So this will still have a bloom setting. We'll set that back to zero. And then for vignetting intensity, we're going to leave the offset alone. The offset brings in the vignette effect from the corners toward the center of the image. Uh, the, the intensity is just how dark it is. So for a nice fairly solid dark edges, we'll give it about 80%. Vignetting offset, we'll leave that at zero for this example. Click return to viewport. But we're going to go ahead and just do two examples at the same time again. So we'll duplicate this viewport to the side. Edit this camera. And in here, in addition to the 80% vignette intensity, we'll also do the vignetting offset. We're going to do something a little unusual. We're going to set this to negative. Uh, actually, negative 50%. We're going to make this pretty extreme. When you do a vignetting offset, 0 is no offset, so it'll look like the default option. 100 means you've pushed it back away from the image all the way. So if you did a vignetting offset of 100, you would no longer see the, the vignette at all, the effect. But if you do a negative offset, you can bring it inwards further than it actually would be. So something like negative 50 or negative 80 will do like a keyhole effect, which is just an interesting effect I'm just going to show you. Select both of these and click update. There you go, and that's pretty obvious. I can see here this is more of a just a gentle vignette effect. It's still pretty dark. This is 80%. So you could turn it down to 50 or 60 and get a little bit less of that effect. This is extreme. This is that high darkness level. But since we gave it a negative offset, it came in towards the center of the image. If we had given this a positive offset, this line where it starts the vignetting would have started out here, basically. So it would have pushed it further away. It just gives you control over sort of the iris shape of the vignette offset. All right, and the final thing we're going to do is we're going to do a special version of one of these viewports here. So we're going to edit the camera this time, but this time we're going to move the camera of this viewport. So edit this viewport's camera. Before we forget, we want to turn off the vignetting. Make sure you set those both back to zero. We'll go back up here and in depth of field. Turn depth of field back on. It looks like we might have left that on before, which is fine. It was too minor to be a big deal. We'll set the focus distance to about 0.5 meters, I suspect. And the f-stop should be around f20. Iris shape circle, that's fine. And now what we're going to do is get the walkthrough tool. Scroll back up. Activate this camera. So it's currently attached to our actual walkthrough. We'll go gamer mode. We'll get really close to these bowls here. These items on the table. Focus distance doesn't really come into its own unless you're very close to an object. So we're going to wiggle in here. It doesn't matter that you get it exact, we're just getting close. There we are. You generally want to be pretty close to an object. That's decent. There we are. Back to selection, return to viewport. And then we also want to duplicate this viewport because we're going to do two versions of this shot here as well. Now this one, when we edit the viewport, we're going to edit the camera again. And in here near the bottom, we're going to change this f-stop from f20 to f2.2 is fine. We're keeping the same focus distance because the objects we care about are at about half a meter away from the screen. So that's good for what we're doing. A half a meter away from your face is basically what it is. So this focus distance is from the camera. Things that are half a meter away in this example will be in focus. So that's about this table. But what we're going to show you here is the, um, the f-stop and how that affects the uh, depth of field render. Select both of these. 
and then hit update. And there we go. Now, the f-stop of 2.2 might have been a little too strong on this one on the right, or we might have just put the focus distance a little too close. We might have wanted to make it a little far to get that so we could have gotten the coffee, the the, uh, the teapot in addition to the bowl. But you can see here that this area right here is in crisp focus, and then it starts to blur as you get further away. That's That sharpness level is controlled by the f-stop. This has the same focus distance, so we're still focused here, but because we had the much larger f-stop setting, a lot more of this scene was included in the focusable range. The larger settings here would be more for outdoors, if you had something very close to you that was maybe half a meter or a meter away from the camera, and then a field in the background that was hundreds of meters or even a kilometer away. Inside a room, you're generally going to stick to the smaller settings, the 2.2 up to like 5. That should do it for camera effects. Uh, the next thing we'll be moving on to is some of the settings in this render style. So now we'll explain a bit how we made this high quality render style that we applied these rendering camera effects to. And I'll even show you a little bit on, uh, see the little bit of, um, it's called fireflies and splotchiness in here. We can correct that by increasing a couple different settings. So we'll be covering the custom RenderWorks settings as well as RenderWorks style settings.